So I actually wanted to start this video with the study that we're going to be discussing very briefly. A speculation about advanced civilizations possibly causing what's known as directed panspermia and basically being responsible for spreading life to various planets, including planet Earth, billions of years ago. With the goal of this short paper essentially being trying to figure out which potential star systems out there they might be from or have resided on in the past and which planets should we focus on in order to see if we can find alien life. And though the study itself is very very simple and extremely short and basically super hypothetical, it does identify seven specific planets that do kind of meet certain criteria. All relatively old, several billion years older than the solar system, basically suggesting that something could have existed there even before life on Earth, all containing terrestrial planets in the habitable zone, and all relatively close to us, astronomically speaking. But only one planet kind of stood out, Kepler-452b. A planet that orbits a G-type star very similar to our Sun and that sometimes has been described as Earth 2.0, but actually still potentially quite different from planet Earth even though it does have a chance to be maybe habitable. Not necessarily inhabited by anything, but just having conditions maybe similar to planet Earth. But despite the simplicity of the study and despite the fact that we obviously knew about all of these planets before and they've already been investigated by a lot of different studies, so far discovering nothing there, I actually still wanted to explore this concept of directed panspermia just to see how likely is it or if humans can one day start it as well. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Let's discuss directed panspermia from a scientific perspective and let's start with basically making a conclusion about this study and whether it makes any sense. Honestly, I don't think it does for one simple reason. In over 4 billion years, ever since the formation of first life on the planet, planet Earth, all of the different stars identified in the study would probably have been in a completely different location, very very far from planet Earth, to be of any concern. During that time, the solar system must have orbited the galaxy at least 16 times, possibly even more, and so it would have changed neighbors many many times. And so if life on Earth was a result of panspermia, it was unlikely to be from any of these stars. They would not have been around. But what about the concept itself? Well, as you can imagine, it's not a new concept at all. Actually, the first idea of directed panspermia is from science fiction in the 30s. It was from this book, Last and the First Man, by Olaf Stapledon. Here was basically the last humans on Earth sending microscopic life toward various potentially habitable areas in the universe as soon as they discover the solar system is going to end soon, which basically kind of became a staple for science fiction with this book basically being the first. But I guess before we discuss directed panspermia or panspermia done by someone, is this concept even feasible in real life? Can anything survive in outer space for, let's just say, hundreds or thousands of years in order to spread life from one object to another? Well, right now, based on various experiments, one of which you can actually learn about in the description below, we know that certain bacteria can survive in outer space for at least maybe three years. This was actually discovered by the Japanese scientists a few years back. But at the moment we don't really have any evidence from any of the asteroids or anything discovered on Earth or in outer space that panspermia is actively going on and any life is being spread from Earth or to Earth by any means. So essentially even right now this is still kind of sort of hypothetical. And so maybe naturally it's somewhat difficult. Maybe most bacteria don't survive for longer than a few years, with outer space basically killing everything within approximately a decade. But what about deliberate transport? If you basically design something to transport life from one place to another, making sure that it does survive the long journey. Well, that's I guess a different story. But first I actually wanted to briefly mention this, I guess somewhat controversial and super hypothetical paper from back in 2013. There was a study by two Kazaki scientists, the wow signal of the terrestrial genetic code, that basically claimed that life on Earth was a result of panspermia by some ancient civilization and they even left a message for us in our genetic code. Genetically engineered to kind of remind us that we are made by someone, with the message being made in China. 
Okay, no, I'm joking. It was actually just some kind of a pattern. But in reality, all of the biologists, all of the geneticists, widely discredited and disproved this paper, explaining that none of this is actually a pattern, none of this so far makes sense, and there was no secret signal in any of the genetic code. And so definitely not the proof of panspermia or that the life on Earth was from somewhere else. Still though, back in 2013, this study definitely went viral. But despite this super hypothetical paper, there are actually a lot of studies from very well known scientists, including of course the famous Carl Sagan, that have speculated about the possibility of either life coming from somewhere else or life from Earth going somewhere else and settling there. As a matter of fact, quite a lot of papers in the 70s even focused on major propositions that maybe humanity should seed other planets with various microorganisms in order to basically expand organic life and ensure the survival of life on Earth but in other conditions. So if something happens to planet Earth and life here is no longer possible, it can still survive in some other star systems. Naturally, this was a contentious view, mostly because scientists also suggested that, okay, but what if life already exists there? All of this could produce unnecessary interference or possibly even complete destruction of native species by possibly more hostile and more destructive life from our own planet. And so obviously there are different opinions and different ways of looking at this. But in this video, I'm not going to touch on ethics. I just wanted to explore the science and if it's even possible. But generally the conclusion here was that in order to avoid any ethical issues, maybe we should focus on extremely young systems or even protoplanetary disks that are still just developing their planets and very likely have no life yet. For example, there's a system at least 25 light years away from us known as Alpha PSA, also known as FOMOVO, that's much younger than the solar system, only about 400 million years old, still contains a relatively large dust ring and definitely contains planets, at least one confirmed. As you can see here, it even still has that accretion disk or the protoplanetary disk that we often expect from young star systems. Or the even younger Beta Pictorius system that's only 23 million years old, where the planets just stopped forming. And here we even have signs of comets and asteroids still bombarding these planets and seeding them with a lot of material that most likely resulted in the formation of life on planet Earth. And so these two systems could be potential targets. There's probably still nothing here, but the planets here could one day provide necessary conditions for maybe life to exist. Or maybe we can look for something even younger. One example is the closest star nursery, Rho Afayakai. This contains lots of new stars and stars that are still obviously just forming and don't even have any planets yet. And at least 400 have been already mapped and are pretty well known. And so basically the idea here would be to send something toward these objects in order to have something from planet Earth to one day settle there and start new life kind of from scratch. With all of these bacteria, if successful, eventually evolving into something different, but obviously following very similar principles to what we have on planet Earth. But I guess now the question is, okay, but how exactly would we do this? What are we going to be sending? Obviously we can just send some kind of a spaceship there, and even if we could, it's extremely unlikely to even survive the journey. Well here, out of many different propositions, the ones that seem to make the most sense involve these tiny microcapsules, basically containing dormant microbes inside. And each of them would be relatively small, possibly even microscopic in size, just containing a few microbes protected from outer space. But quite a lot of them could be then placed in one larger capsule in order to be then accelerated to various locations where all of these microcapsules would then be spread once they arrive to certain star systems. And so essentially it's a kind of a shotgun approach. You send a larger capsule that spreads smaller capsules in order to seed as much of an area in a typical star system as possible. And so at least a few of these, out of like thousands and even millions, could be captured by various planets. But previous studies were even able to calculate the approximate chance of success depending on the number of microbes sent. And turns out that for a typical star system, we would have to send a biomass of at least 300 kilograms in order to seed a single star, or at least 200 for each of the objects in the Rho Fayakai. And that of course is not a very small capsule. It would still have to be accelerated and sent to outer space 
at relatively large velocities using modern technology and of course using modern propulsion. But in order for these capsules to basically survive and for these microbes not to deteriorate, they would have to move relatively fast. And the best way to accelerate something to fast velocities with such a payload would be a solar sail. With several studies establishing that the solar sail has to be pretty large, possibly at least 500 meters across. And so this would maybe allow a certain capsule to reach fast enough velocities with the journey only lasting thousands of years instead of millions. And so for example, in order to reach that system I showed you previously, the FOMO system, the journey here might last up to 50,000 years. But using the same propulsion, in order to reach the nearest molecular cloud, we would probably need at least 800,000 years, possibly even longer. And that's using the best current technologies and the most efficient propulsion. So basically solar sails, which would first accelerate and then decelerate upon arrival. And 800,000 years is maybe pushing it just a little bit. Mostly because currently we don't have any evidence that anything even on Earth can survive that long. And so let's briefly talk about DNA. We know that due to degradation processes, for example, cross-linking, deamination, fragmentation, even with the best preservation conditions, most DNA completely degrades anywhere from 400,000 to 1.5 million years after the bacteria becomes sedentary or enters some kind of a stasis. And so basically without being active and continuously reproducing, any DNA sample is just going to completely degrade. And one of the oldest DNA samples that was kind of sequenced to some extent is approximately 1.6 million years old. Although there might be a sample from Greenland from 2022 that might be just a little bit older, at 2 million years old. Although that one is still quite damaged and so kind of difficult to sequence. But in general, DNA by itself degrades really fast. Within about 6.8 million years, only one single base pair remains even in a relatively large sample of DNA. And that means that, well, if these bacteria are just going to stay in stasis and basically become frozen for like 800,000 years, there's an extremely high chance that none of them will survive. And none of them might even make it to this location. But there might be some good news. And they're actually based on studies where life was revived after thousands of years and was still able to do all of its regular stuff. So for example, there are different studies that were able to revive bacteria and viruses from various samples in permafrost with many samples in thousands of years old. But the most exciting study out of all of this is the one involving nematodes. Nematodes, as you might know, are extremely simple worms. But they're also basically animals. And a very successful type of an animal as well. And so a while back, one of these was revived from a sample that was about 46,000 years old. And so surviving for 46,000 years in cryostasis, even for animals, seems to be possible. Making these worms also a potential target for any kind of a panspermia journey. Moreover, a couple of years ago, one of the Japanese teams was investigating seafloor, with the researchers drilling into the seafloor down to about one kilometer. And they actually found ancient mud. But to their surprise, in that mud, they were able to find bacteria that could then be revived with these samples being at least 100 million years old. And that by itself was really intriguing because it implies either that bacteria can somehow survive extremely long or they can find ways to basically reproduce very, very slowly for millions of years, sort of maintaining their DNA through various means unknown to us. And so the discovery of these deep sea bacteria that somehow was able to survive inside sediment for millions and millions of years possibly provides us with solutions to how this directed panspermia could be done if it's ever done. And so basically by recreating similar conditions inside of these capsules, it might become possible for all of this life to kind of survive inside these capsules until they finally reach the destination, even if it takes millions of years. And to obviously increase success even more, different types of organisms could be included in these capsules, because some of them might be more suitable for certain conditions. For example, sending these organisms, rotifers, which are single cells but are technically eukaryotes, could dramatically increase the chances for complex life to arise because their DNA is a lot more complex and more resilient compared to bacteria. And obviously we could send things like tardigrades, animals that we know can't survive in space with experiments from the International Space Station already showing us their resilience. And so the theory behind all of this is, I guess, kind of there. 
We just don't really have an exact plan and potentially a more definitive proposition on how all of this could be done. But after all of this, I guess the question is, should we? Is this something that most people would agree with? Or is this something that we should maybe not do at all? And so there's obviously that ethical implication. And honestly, I personally have no opinions on this. So let me know what you think. Is it actually beneficial for life from our planet to try to spread somewhere else and possibly settle on other worlds? Especially if humanity finds a way to do this very effectively with almost 100% guaranteed chance of success? Or should we just let it be and let the life finally perish in approximately 300 to maybe 500 million years from now when Earth becomes just a little bit too toasty and the runaway greenhouse effect basically kills everything? So what do you think? I personally kind of like this idea a little bit better, mostly because that's how a lot of science fiction starts as well. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, on that note, we'll definitely come back and talk more about this once I discover more studies and more exciting ideas in regards to panspermia. But until then, check out previous videos in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.